Welcome to Unit 2, Structure and Properties. This unit in the textbook is divided into two chapters, uh, chapters 3 and 4. So we'll begin with chapter 3, which relates to atomic structure. Now the next two slides here have a list of the learning goals for this chapter. So when you're looking to summarize what you've learned, you may want to revisit these learning goals. You'll notice in the first learning goal here that you should be able to discuss the development of the atom from earliest atomic theory to modern day theory of the atom. So the earliest atomic theory here, that's lesson one, so the current video. And then the modern day theory of the atom refers to the quantum model that'll be covered in lesson two. Both Rutherford and Bohr here are considered part of the earlier atomic theory, and so they'll be covered in lesson one. And all of the terminology will show up as we go through the unit. And so these are the learning goals that we'll focus on for this particular lesson. But you'll see that I have a sequence of learning goals that cover really everything we do in Chapter 3. So you'll notice here we continue to be able to draw energy level diagrams and electron, electron configuration and then get into quantum numbers and properties of elements in the S, P, and D blocks of the periodic table. So all of these learning goals apply to lessons that are coming up in Chapter 3. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're able to see a video on the screen right now. It is um, from a TED lesson. I've put the URL so that if you can't see it, you could move into a browser and go and check out the video. It's about five minutes long. I'd like you to watch this video and then come back to my video. Okay, so hopefully it's visible for you right on the screen, but if it isn't, there's the URL. Go watch it. It's five minutes and then come back to this video. Okay, so you've watched the video. We are going to focus in on Rutherford's model of the atom and in the next slide, Bohr's model of the atom. So you'll recall from the video that Rutherford experimented with a gold foil apparatus. There was a source of helium nuclei referred to as alpha particles, which are have a positive charge. And then we have, I've drawn it in yellow here, the gold foil. And this curved part here was a detector screen. So a zinc sulfide detector screen. So based on your recollection from the video then, what do you recall happening to the alpha particles as they pass through the gold foil? Just to slide up here, you'll see I'm looking for you to recall and fill in the blanks for the observations and then come up with the inferences. And so observation number one, what did we, what did, what was one of the key features of the results here? Hopefully you're recalling that most of the rays passed straight through. And so Oops, and so there are lots of rays passing straight through, striking the detector. In the middle of this curved screen. Okay, so most rays pass straight through. Okay, now what else happened? Well, there was some deflection, yes. So hopefully you've, whoops, hopefully you've remembered that. There definitely was some particles deflected. Okay, so our second observation is that some rays are deflected. Last observation is that very few were actually reflected. And so I've drawn multiple rays passing through. 
a few, four of them deflecting and only two reflecting. So the idea here, and I'm looking to exaggerate the results here, but to show that in these observations, most rays do pass straight through the foil, some are deflected and very few are reflected. So what are the direct inferences then that we can make about these, about the atom? So based on the fact that most rays pass straight through, we could say that the atom is, hopefully you've recalled, mostly, oops, sorry about that, I've already done that, mostly empty space. We'll draw a picture of this in a minute. Now what about the fact that some of the rays are deflected? Well, the inference here is that the positive charge is more concentrated than in the previous model. Do you remember whose chocolate chip or plum pudding model, chocolate chip cookie model, plum pudding model? That was Thompson. Okay, and the fact that very few rays are deflected, reflected, sorry, must mean that there's a very small, very densely positively charged center of the atom. And yes, we know that to be called the nucleus. So if we're comparing Thompson's plum pudding or chocolate chip muffin or chocolate chip cookie model, to Rutherford's nuclear model, Rutherford was actually expecting different results than he obtained. So recall, and I'm just showing you down here to summarize here, recall that Thompson's idea of the atom was that there was positive charge loosely spread throughout the sphere. And so this positive charge here is not strongly positive, it's really spread throughout the sphere. And then the electrons were just negative charges spread throughout the atom. So what was he expecting as these rays approached? Well, he said it was like shooting a bullet at tissue paper. He was expecting that these rays would pass through. Yes, these are positively charged particles, but the positive charge in the atom was so loosely spread out that he wasn't expecting really much repulsion there at all. And so it was incredible to him to see the actual results where very few of the beams, and yet it still happened, reflected right back. And he's known to comment that as it was like shooting uh, a bullet at a piece of tissue paper and having it bounce right back at you. Now it's true that most of the rays did pass through, and you can see that most of the atom is empty space, and so a lot of the rays are passing straight through. Now as rays got close to the nucleus, but not quite at the nucleus, they deflected. And so we'll see the, the deflection happening. So that nucleus must be very positively charged, very small in relation to the size of the atom. Okay, that's it for Rutherford's model. He really focused on the nucleus. Not much was said about the electrons, and that's where we left it up to Niels Bohr to come up with a description of the location of the electrons. So in Bohr's model, we have, I first want you to think of a staircase. So just the idea that you might be standing on a staircase here. Oops, let's move your arms up a bit. Okay, so you're standing on the first step. Right, and as you hop up to the second step, you're now set standing on the second step. And as you move up to the third step, you're standing on the third step. At no point do you hover, because hey, it's not Hogwarts, we're not wizards or witches here, so at no point do you hover in between two of the stairs. You're always standing on one of the steps. And that's Bohr's idea, if we can translate that now. We have the Rutherford's idea of the nucleus in the center, and then Bohr's idea of these orbits, or circular paths where electrons would be found. So here's an example of an electron 
And Bohr's prediction is that this electron is going to move in a fixed path around the nucleus. His, ter his term for this orbiting path was, is called an orbit. Not to be confused with the term orbital, which is different. An orbital will be seen in the quantum model of the atom. Bohr's idea is fixed paths for the electrons called orbits. And so there's the first orbit, which is closest to the nucleus and lowest in energy, and then the second orbit and third and fourth and fifth and so on. And the idea is that this would continue indefinitely. So that was Bohr's idea. Now, just like with the stairs where we can't hover in between two stairs, Bohr's idea is that the energy of the electron is only allowed to be certain specific values. So that electron could be in the first orbit or the second orbit or the third orbit, but you certainly wouldn't find it in between two orbits or in between two energy levels. And so just to move this up a bit so you can see, in terms of Bohr's postulates, the idea is that the energy of the electron is quantized, which is exactly the point of that electron being found in specific orbits and not in between them. Only certain values are allowed. Think of money. You can have a five cent piece, so a nickel, or a 10 cent piece, a dime, but we don't have one coin that packages seven cents or 12 cents or even 15 cents. We have a quarter which packages 25 cents and though there's certain allowed packages of cents or money, if you will, in our coins. And that's the idea the energy of the electron is quantized. So there's certain allowed values of the uh, energy for the electron. Now the third postulate here has three parts to it. And I'll go back up to the picture in a minute to just elaborate on that. So when an atom absorbs energy, it's the electron that moves. The electron transitions to a higher energy level, which we call an excited state. As that electron transitions back down from higher to lower energy levels then, energy will be released. And the key is that we will see that release, that energy release, as a specific band of color in what we call the emission spectrum of the element. And this is something, an experiment that we'll look at in class so that you can actually visualize and see this. So just to finish this actual picture here, let's imagine that in the hydrogen atom we have an electron in the ground state. Ground state is the lowest energy, most stable place for the electron. So ground state is the lowest, lowest energy state of the electron. And for hydrogen, that electron is found in the first shell. Now, as a hydrogen atom is energetically excited, like for example, in the fireworks at the end of that video, that electron transitions, so it absorbs energy, and if it absorbs enough energy, it may jump all the way up or transition all the way up to the fourth energy level. Now we would say that that electron is in the excited state. To continue with the third postulate, as that electron transitions back down to a lower energy level, it may not get all the way back down to ground state, but let's say it goes from n equals four to n equals two. As it does that, it releases a photon of energy. And that may correspond to a specific band of color in the visible spectrum of light. So we'll be looking at gas discharge tubes and observing the emission spectrum of various elements. Uh, know that Bohr studied in particular the emission spectrum of hydrogen. And so that's the first one we will look at. Now, if his model had been correct, then he would have been able to predict the emission spectrum of multi-electron atoms. But in fact, his calculations did not prove to be accurate. And so the evolution of atomic theory continued, uh, developing into the current model, the quantum model of the atom, which will be the topic of our next video.
So just to show you the very bottom of this note was really just finishing writing in those postulates. So hopefully you have that down and you're good to go.